when Kahir Mawr Difrin Epkalak Avikovaran was but a little ten-year-old lad, Ailil, Kahir's older brother, died. In the Difrin family, it was customary that the male members of the family held a silent vigil lasting a whole day and night over the body of a fallen kinsman. But Kahir, not quite being a man yet, was not allowed to take part in this vigil. So he and his other younger relatives clowned around Darn Difra Castle instead. He also beat up anyone who said their fathers and older brothers were stronger and braver than Ailil. Eventually, when his mother, Mawr, red from crying, called him over, she had a very important message for him. Remember, son? Mawr sobbed, pressing the boy so hard to her breast he couldn't catch his breath. Remember this day? Remember who took the life from your dear brother, Ailil? The damn Nordlings did it! Your foes, my son! You are ever to hate them! You are to hate that damned, murderous nation! I shall hate them, mother of mine! Kahir promised, somewhat surprised. The reason Kahir was somewhat surprised by this was that it was well known that Ailil had died a praiseworthy warrior's death, and also his grandmother, Eviva, Maur's mother, was descended from Nordlings. But he still happily pledged that he would hate them, and when he grew up, he'd chop their heads off. He grew up indeed to be Count Kahir Maur Difrin, a young officer from Vikovaro. Vikovaro had been conquered by Nilfgaard, but that didn't mean they could call themselves Nilfgaardians. In fact, Kahir was adamant that he was not a Nilfgaardian at all. He was a Vikovaran, and this Vikovaran was given the honorable task of intercepting the Princess of Sintra when the Nilfgaardians attacked the city, so she might be delivered to Emir. This was a job that he was not particularly happy with, because it did not seem to give him much chance for fame and glory. However, when the Emperor of Nilfgaard tells you to jump, you ask him how high. And so, with the city on fire, Kahir charged through with his contingent of Nilfgaardian soldiers and eventually found Ciri, alongside her Sintrian knights. After a struggle, only Ciri and Kahir were left standing. His men were dead, but so were the Sintrians defending Ciri. The girl in question was stuck under a horse, and when Kahir finally dismounted to pick her up, she screamed and fainted after looking at his large, winged helmet. Wrapped in a wet cloak, he managed to sneak both of them out of the city and to a nearby river where he tried to clean up Ciri as best he could. Exhausted, the two both fell asleep afterwards, and when Kahir woke up, Ciri was gone. He had failed in his mission, and the Emperor did not look kindly on failure. He was locked up for two years before he was eventually summoned to the Emperor's chambers once more. In order for everything to be perfectly clear, the man behind the table addressed him. You should understand that the mistake you made in this town two years ago has not been forgiven. You are getting one more chance. You are getting one more order. My decision as to your ultimate fate depends on the way in which you carry it out. The young knight's face did not twitch, and nor did a single feather on the wings adorning the helmet at his hip. I never deceive anyone. I never give anyone false illusions, continued the man. So let it be known that, naturally, the prospect of saving your neck from the executioner's axe exists only if you do not make a mistake this time. Your chances of a full pardon are small. Your chances of my forgiving and forgetting are non-existent. The Emperor's words were quite clear. Kahir would attempt to capture Ciri once more at Thanet, his last chance to redeem himself somewhat, for at Thanet the Nilfgaardian traitors would spring a trap. Although try as he might, he was foiled yet again because the sorceresses opened fire on one another a little too violently, and in the madness he'd lost sight of Ciri entirely. An elf he came across told him that Ciri had been seen outside the palace, and indeed there he found her. Except she was not the easy catch he'd hoped. While initially she tried to flee, Kahir lost control of his horse and fell straight off. In a few steps, he was with her. You will not escape me now, O oh lion cub of Sintra, he said, and his cruel eyes burned in the slit of his helmet. Not this time. This time you have nowhere to run, O oh reckless maiden. You will not touch me, 
she repeated in a voice of stifled horror, her back pressed against the stone wall. I have to. I am carrying out orders. As he held out his hand to seize her, Ciri's fear subsided. To be replaced by savage fury, her tense muscles, previously frozen in terror, began to work like springs. All the moves she had learned in Kaer Morhen performed themselves smoothly and fluidly. Ciri jumped. The knight lunged towards her, but was unprepared for the pirouette which spun her effortlessly out of reach of his hands. The fight between the two was quick, and as Ciri's sword knocked off Kahir's helmet, she jumped back to land the mortal blow, but stopped herself. Under that helmet, Kahir was just a dark-haired young man with exceptionally blue eyes that showed nothing but fear, kneeling in a pool of blood. And so, not wanting to kill him, Ciri left. Squiatel approached soon after, intending to aid Kahir, but he told them to leave him and go after Ciri instead. That was never going to happen, as Geralt showed up to cut them all down. After which, Geralt turned to Kahir, who begged him not to kill him. The only reason Geralt does in fact spare him is because the boy tells him that it was he who saved Ciri from Sintra in the first place. Falling unconscious, he is eventually found and rescued by Isengrim Falcharna, leader of the Squiatel group. Kahir became delirious on the ship sailing back, yelling about Ciri, an insane girl with green eyes, and a witcher who had massacred his men, among other things. He had failed again, but even worse, he was about to be framed by Vilgefortz's men. They had captured a young girl who looked like Ciri, but was not her, and had delivered her to Nilfgaard in Cahir and Rienz's name. However, Amir was no fool and realized quickly that this was not really Ciri. He assumed that Cahir was working with Vilgefortz to undermine him and branded him a traitor. Both Cahir and Rienz were to be captured and tortured. The Emperor's Seneschal, Kalach, Cahir's father, begged for his son's life to no avail. Nilfgaard's agents began to scour the land for the traitorous Count Cahir, and word of his intended capture eventually also reached Isengrim Falcharna, who had Cahir in custody already. He was locked up in a coffin and sent out for delivery to Nilfgaard through a hawker. Lucky for him, that transport was accidentally intercepted by Geralt and Dandelion, posing as elves. When the Nilfgaardians appeared to take the coffin off the hawker's hands, it turned out that they did not intend to pay the hawker a thing, and instead murdered him and his coachman. They also attempted to kill Geralt and Dandelion, of course, but failed miserably when Maria Baring, also known as Milva, jumped out of the woods to loose a few arrows on them. They opened Cahir's coffin together, where they found him, gagged and bound. Geralt, recognizing him, initially meant to leave him bound, but Dandelion didn't agree, and so he cut the strap on Cahir's left arm, gave him a knife, and left him like that, promising to kill him when next they'd meet. Except they met quite soon afterwards, because Cahir had followed the group. He introduced himself and absolutely refused to fight Geralt, even though the Witcher really, really wanted to. Kahir wanted to join them. He wanted to help find Ciri, and he was a little annoyed. They kept calling him a Nilfgaardian. He was not a Nilfgaardian, he was from Vicovaro. He didn't even have a Nilfgaardian accent. But the team wouldn't budge, and actually threatened to shoot his horse. So Kahir made his valiant escape, even though the threat was an empty one. He did keep following the party at a distance as a sort of strange Nilfgaardian rearguard. And then one day, Kahir was attacked by three bandits, and while he won the battle easily enough, his horse got away from him, eventually passing Geralt's party, the saddle red with blood. The party assumed that Kahir had died, but when the party was in some trouble of their own, Kahir came to their rescue, saving Milva from certain death. So their odd companionship started, and as it did, he informed Milva immediately that Ciri was not in Nilfgaard. The Ciri in Nilfgaard was a fake. After the group had regrouped, as it were, and Regis had been revealed as a vampire, Geralt turned his attention to Cahir once more. He meant to fight him again, but this time Milva stepped in. Cahir had saved her life and their horses, so she would not allow his death. A while later, when Geralt finally deigns to speak to Cahir and air his grievances, the Count reveals that he is not out to harm Ciri. In fact, just like Geralt, Cahir and Ciri are linked through destiny. Cahir, too, has dreams of Ciri, where he sees her run wild with the gang of the rats. Taking some time to think on this, Geralt and Cahir do not continue their conversation. Instead, the group gets ready to make some food. 
Cahir even manages to catch a fish, still constantly insisting that he is not a Nilfgaardian. Throughout the whole thing, Geralt would not stop sulking, but their alliance had now been struck. Cahir would travel with this company until they found Ciri, and so on they went, still constantly teasing Cahir by calling the Vikovaran a Nilfgaardian, traveling as travelers do. Said travels were only interrupted somewhat when it turned out that Milva was pregnant. She had requested that Regis allow her to end the pregnancy through a medicine, but Regis wanted to discuss the matter with the rest of the group too. However, as far as Cahir was concerned, this should be up to Milva and Milva only. As it turned out, the whole group was quite in line with that thinking. It was Milva's choice. However, it would certainly slow the travels down. This became a real problem when they came to a river that needed crossing. A river beset on both sides by armies. One of them, Nilfgaard, the other, Northerners. The group was in the middle of the river on a rickety ferry, rushing downstream. And when they eventually got off, Milva was having a miscarriage and couldn't run. Cahir decided that their only option was to hold the singular bridge that connected the two river banks. They would fight on the side of the Nordlings against Nilfgaard to give Milva time to recover and escape. Because lest we forget, Cahir was still an army officer. How do you plan to do it? I'm an officer, don't forget. Climb up that pier and onto the bridge. On the bridge, Cahir demonstrated that he was indeed experienced at bringing panicked soldiers under control. Where are you going, scum? Where are you going, bastards? He yelled. Each roar was accompanied by a punch as he knocked a fleeing soldier down onto the bridge's boards. Stop! Stop, you fucking swine! Some, but far from all, of the fleeing soldiers stopped, terrified by the roaring and flashing of the sword Cahir was whirling dramatically. Others tried to sneak behind his back, but Geralt had already drawn his sword and joined the spectacle. Where are you going? he shouted, catching one of the soldiers in his tracks in a powerful grip. Where? Stand fast! Get back there! It took some more yelling, but eventually this northern army was led by a witcher and a Nilfgaardian. I mean, Vikovaren. A wave of Nilfgaardians now rammed through the defenses, but they'd come too far already. And so, Cahir was forced to kill his own, making his choice to stand by Geralt and his newfound friends. They leapt and whirled through the crowd, cutting down man after man. The Nordlings were mighty inspired at this and finally joined their valiant commanders. They were so inspired, in fact, that they blocked off Geralt and Cahir's escape to Milva, forcing them to fight out the battle entirely. Thanks to Cahir's expert guidance, they came out on top and were subsequently honored by Queen Meave of Lyria and Rivia herself, who immediately added them to her army. They only traveled on together for a while before they all deserted, of course, in search of Ciri, which meant that Cahir had now deserted from both Nilfgaard and the North, an accomplishment indeed. However, his Nilfgaardian-ness certainly came in handy whenever they met a Nilfgaardian. Cahir could simply bark something menacing in an officer-like tone, and they generally back off. Eventually, they found out about a certain half-elf in the neighborhood who might know more about the people hunting Ciri and Geralt as well. So, they set out to try and get that information out of him. Geralt sets up teams for his little plan, and during said planning phase, it turns out that Geralt doesn't trust Cahir after all. By this point, Vilgefortz had captured Yennefer and read her mind, so he knew all about their little gang. But Geralt thinks Cahir has betrayed them instead. They argue, and Cahir decides to punch Geralt in the face for his baseless accusations, erupting in a weird kind of ground fisticuffs until Milva starts lashing them both with a leather belt, yelling at them to stop being thickheads. On Regis's recommendation, they decided not to revisit this topic again. Regardless, their little plan to find the half-elf goes horribly wrong, because the half-elf recognizes Geralt quite easily, something Geralt hadn't planned on for some reason. So, Angoulême, Cahir and Geralt are stuck in a sticky situation, only barely escaping with their lives, and Cahir was wounded rather heavily in the process. In fact, Cahir was nearly scalped. He could barely sit up straight on his horse. They decide that Angoulême would run off to get help, while Geralt stayed hidden with Cahir on foot. Cahir could barely move after a while, and so Geralt carried him this way or that for a while, until they finally made it to the safety of a nearby cave. 
There, Cahir came down with a fever, while Geralt sewed the patch of skin on his head to his skull using twine and a crooked needle. All the while, Cahir was entirely conscious. Throughout the night, Cahir's fever flared, but the next morning he seemed somewhat better. They spoke about Ciri. Ciri's alive. I've had dreams again. Yes, something happened at the Equinox. Something dreadful. Yes, without doubt. I felt and saw it. But she's alive. She's definitely alive. Let's hurry. But not to avenge and murder. To find her. Yes, yes, Cahir, you're right. And you? Don't you have dreams now? I do, he said bitterly. But seldom since we crossed the Aruga, and I remember nothing after waking. Something has ended in me, Cahir. Something has burned out. Something has ruptured in me. Never mind, Geralt. I shall dream for both of us. As they spoke, Cahir revealed that the second time he took the job to find Ciri, he did not do so to please the Emperor, but because he couldn't forget her. He had started having dreams about her, but not the child Ciri. The Ciri as she was now, running with the rats. He was in love with her. He also realized, unfortunately, that he could never have her, of course, but had hoped that if she was at least in Nilfgaard, he could see her. Not wanting to go into it, Geralt and Cahir simply agreed to be comrades for now. After reaching their friends again, things happened fast. The half-elf they hunted was eventually burned to death, and with Cahir's wounds still not healed, they decided to take their rest in Toussaint's Beauclair Palace, at the invitation of Anna Harrietta. They spent longer than many would have liked here, while Geralt had grown somewhat complacent, but eventually they packed their bags, and through the snowy mountains they made their way at last to Vilgefortz's castle, Stiga. There, a battle broke out almost immediately as the witcher's group barged in. Milva was the first to die, Angulem the second. Cahir himself, eventually, at last, came face to face with Ciri, the girl he loved. She was on the run from Leo Bonhart, and, not taking his own safety into account, Cahir chose to stay behind as Ciri ran to slow down Bonhart. Although he fought like a lion and proved skilled indeed, he was no match for Bonhart. He was cut down then and there in defense of Ciri at last. A warrior's death, noble indeed, just like his brother. I'm sure you're not surprised, but we're not doing skits at the end cards today either. I am so sorry. My patrons are getting titles today. I hope you appreciate those too. Walgai the Illustrious. Robertson the Enlightened. Lakmoin the Fierce. MJ Kulsta the Impressive. Septic the Catist. Mike Zuiers the Unrelenting. Adrian, Adrian Peckle, the impeccable. Ray Ray, the fortuitous. Freeman, the wise. 